Let's begin with some guided meditation. You may settle down. Uh, Sitting in what may appear to you like a meditation posture, closing your eyes, experiencing whatever it is that the body and mind telling you here and now, in this moment. You can quickly scan your body. From head to toes. Noticing any tension or tightness anywhere in your body. Just allowing things to be without getting caught in those emotions. Any respond, any need to respond. Mindfully you breathe in. Mindfully you breathe out. Mindfully you breathe in. Mindfully you breathe out. Now we will examine some unknown territories in our sensory world. Accepting them without a judgment, without any shame, without getting caught in any one of those. Just letting things be. Sense of Fear, sense of anxiety, sense of curiosity. 
ability to feel joy, desire to experience pleasure, wanting to let go of any pain, and in between the reality that this too shall pass. Once again, mindfully you breathe in, mindfully you breathe out. And that means you notice the way that your body experiences in breath and out breath. Slowly and gradually making space for tranquility, calmness, peace and wisdom. permeating this body with that tranquility. Continue to breathe in and breathe out, applying more and more mindfulness. That means noticing that you are with breath without getting distracted. Let us look at the positive side of fear, anxiety, 
and these emotions. Fear is there sometimes to protect us, to give us a sense of security and belonging in a certain place or in a situation. Everything that you want to achieve is on the other side of this fear. So we disown it. And most of our imagination is what causes us to get intense fear and panic. It's in our own thoughts. You can ask yourself, has it ever happened? If so, was it that bad? Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it yours? It arises when causes and conditions are present and it vanishes when causes and conditions disappear. Like anything that too shall pass. There is anxiety sometimes before doing an event. And that is because you want to do better. So that is the good thing, good side of that anxiety. It often involves the future, an event, that has not happened yet. A mind projects different thoughts toward that event, causing more panic and taking away the time to prepare and face it. <clears throat> As an acronym, fear could be face everything and not run away from it. Friendly, ethical, acceptance, reassuring. You can be creative with these words and letters. With skillful thinking, you can conquer these feelings. Fear is like joy. They come and go. So nothing is permanent. If it is not in your control that it arises without letting you know, there is no need to identify with it. It will live as long as it wants to live and it will vanish when it wants to vanish. Acceptance is key to overcoming these. 
negative emotions as some people have labeled them. Accepting, not identifying with them, facing them, allowing thing, them to be, and loving them. for letting them in. We are going to do a group reading. Um, so those who are joining on Zoom can also read, but keeping your mic muted would be very useful. Okay, fear and terror. This is from <clears throat> the Bayer of a Sutta. I have shortened it. Uh, you see M N four. That means middle length. This Majjhimanikaya four. Majjhimanikaya means a collection of middle length discourses of the Buddha. Let's read. Then Janusonin, the Brahman, went to the Buddha. After an exchange of friendly greetings, he sat on one side. Then he asked. Let's read together. So, Master Gosama, it is not easy to endure isolated forests or wilderness dwellings. It is not easy to maintain seclusion, not easy to enjoy being alone. The forest, as it were, plunder the mind of a monk who has not attained concentration. Yes, Brahman, so it is. Before my self-awakening, when I was still just an unawakened aspire of awakening, thoughts of fear occurred to me as well. When some contemplatives are unpurified in their bodily, verbal, mental activities and livelihood, covetous and fiercely passionate, potential pleasure, angry, sleepy, restless, doubtful and uncertain, with self-praise and disparaging others, with panic and dread, desires of gains and fame, lacking persistence, 
muddled in their mindfulness lacking concentration lacking wisdom resort to isolated forest or wilderness dwelling it is the fault of those activities and behaviors that they give rise to unskillful fear and terror but i am purified in this my bodily activity seeing in myself this purity of bodily activity i felt even more undaunted about staying in the wilderness the thought occurred to me what if on designated night i were to stay in sort of places that are all inspiring and make your hair stand on it such as park shrine forest shrine and tree shrine perhaps i would get to see that fear and terror and while i was staying there a wild animal would come or a bird would drop a twig or wind would rustle the fallen leaves the thought would occur to me is is that fear and terror coming then the thought occurred to me why do i keep waiting for fear what if i were to subdue fear and terror in whatever state they come so when fear and terror came while i was walking back and forth i would not stand or sit or lie down i would keep walking back and forth until i had subdued that fear and terror when fear and terror came while i was standing i would not walk or sit or lie down i would keep standing until i had subdued that fear and terror when fear and terror came while i was sitting i would not lie down or stand up or walk i would keep sitting until i had subdued that fear and terror when fear and terror came while i was lying down i would not sit up or stand or walk i would keep lying down until i had subdued that fear and terror also there are some contemplatives who have the perception of day when it is night and of night when it is day this i tell you is their being in a dwelling of delusion as for me i have the perception of day when it is day and of night when it is night one moment please i need to mute this one person Okay. Okay, let's read again. Unflagging persistence was aroused in me and unmuddled mindfulness established. My body was calm and unaroused. My mind concentrated and single, quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful quality, I entered and remained in the first jhana. rapture and pleasure born of seclusion accompanied by directed thought and evaluation with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluation i entered and remained in the second jhana rapture and pleasure born of concentration unification of awareness free from directed thoughts and evaluation internal assurance with the fading of rapture i remained equanimous mindful and alert and sense pleasure with the body i entered and remained in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare equanimous and mindful he has the pleasant abiding with the abandoning of pleasure and pain as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress i entered and remained in the fourth jhana purity of equanimity and mindfulness neither pleasure nor pain when the mind was thus concentrated purified bright unblemished rid of defilement pliant malleable steady and attained to imperturbability i directed it to the knowledge of recollecting my past life the knowledge of the past passing away and reappearance of being and the knowledge of the ending of defilement i discerned as it had come to be that this is suffering this is the origination of suffering this is the cessation of suffering this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering these are defilements this is the origination of effluent this is the cessation of defilement this is the way leading to the cessation of defilement my heart thus knowing thus seeing was released from the defilement of sensuality released from the defilement of becoming released from the defilement of ignorance with this release there was the knowledge released I discern that birth is ended the holy life fulfilled the task done there is nothing further for this world now brahman 
If the thought should occur to you, perhaps Gautam as a contemplative is even today not free of passion, not free of aversion, not free of delusion, which is why he resorts to isolated forest and wilderness dwelling. It should not be seen in that way. It's through seeing two compelling reasons that I resort to isolated forest and wilderness dwelling. Seeing a pleasant abiding from myself in the present and feeling sympathy for future generations. Magnificent Master Gautama, magnificent. Just as if I were to place upright what was overturned, to reveal what was hidden, to show the way to one who has lost, or to carry a lamp into the dark so that those with the eyes could be formed. In the same way as Master Gautama, through many lines of reasoning, made the Dhamma clear. I go to Master Gautama for refuge to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Mark. May Master Gautama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge and from this day forward for life. Okay, so what resonates with you in this reading? What word, phrase, sentence, anything at all? Yeah. I really like the question, why do I just keep waiting for fear on the first page? Mm -hmm. I don't know, that just really resonated with me because I feel like I have that kind of mental construct of that perceiving thought. Of like I'm not actually in a situation of fearful that I am not waiting for it as anticipation. I think we all are like that. That we expect something that we shouldn't, we we don't have to. Mm -hmm in our you know own personal lives and this is only known to us and that's just I think part of being human. Um and the way the Buddha challenged it is just seeing it. Sometimes most of this is rooted in not knowing. Right? Um if he was walking he would just continue walking. He could have run from that fear without investigating, without really knowing what caused that sound. Um, this is something he said also in another sutra called Noble Search, Arya Pariyasana Sutra. When he heard something in thick wilderness, he faced it. But not everyone can do it though. Some fears are different. Uh, they are rooted in somewhere not known to us. You want to say more, or should I continue talking? <laughs> um, some, um, you know, there's in psychology there's a thing called triangulation. So uh, to explain that better, um, I would use my friend's family. So, um, two sons, I think about 12 years apart, but the father only favored the younger one. So the older one felt this triangulation that he's not loved by his father. Because of this, he developed some kind of panic that I have to do everything on my own. I must learn to survive. And now the father is gone because of old age and the two brothers don't ever communicate. Um, that favoritism of the father caused them to also develop this separation. But for the older brother, um, his smartness helped him, that he became a scientist, um, very independent, but he still struggles with sense of 
security and sense of belonging and the anxiety that there is no one to look after me. So that's just one example how that triangulation affects many years of someone's life. Um, but if we study more about fear, well, 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 let's talk more. What else did you think interesting in this reading? Any word? So in the last paragraph, mm -hmm. and it got this idea that it's impossible to like be completely free of the, the struggles that, that the human experience. But yeah. We, but rather taking time to be curious, be present, and have sympathy for the human experience helps you be free of it in a way. That's what I took from that. Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting observation that we can't be completely free, but we can sympathize in both ways with others and with you know, inwardly with ourselves. Um, where did you see that second to last paragraph? Yeah. You said? Yeah. And now, Brahman, if the thought should occur to you. Yeah, that. Yeah. So this is about Gautama here is the Buddha and this Janus Sonin may have a thought that the Buddha is not free from free, free of passion, free of aversion, not free of delusion. Um, and the Buddha says it should not be seen in that way. I mean, um, if the Janus Sonin the Brahman were to think that the Buddha still needs meditation, that is why he's in the forest. The Buddha gives two reasons here, um, two compelling reasons, he says. I resort to isolated forest and wilderness dwelling. First, seeing a place pleasant abiding for me. I love the forest. I love these places. And second, Feeling sympathy for future generations. That's what. That's very. Uh, um, that. In it, many things he says through that. What I saw in my first reading of it is that he wants to teach more, teach in the future, continue teaching until he has taught both monks, nuns, lay lay women and laymen. Uh, and then he feels that they are established in understanding. See, right before it said the origin of suffering, understanding suffering and letting go of it. Like fear is a form of suffering and knowing its origin. You know, in, uh, in, in that same passage, there was a, um, I think that is one, two, uh, three, the first <clears throat> passage of the second uh, page. Um, I remained equanimous, mindful, and alert, and sensed pleasure with my body. So that pleasure is meditation pleasure. Um, and that is a level of meditation called third jhana. Um, so it has you know, when, once you enter that, he, that person has a pleasant abiding. And before they enter the fourth jhana, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, that means abandoning of any painful experience like fear. So fear is something to be abandoned. Um, I entered and remained in the fourth jhana, where there is purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. What would it be like to be in that experience? If you were to think, 
instead of thinking that I don't deserve to be there or, you know, it, I, I may never enter that kind of level in my meditation. <clears throat> it's interesting that kind of giving us a path to escape to. Um, but with more understanding and sense of letting go. Um, although I wasn't sure that this whole group may not be prepared to read something like that because it is like also the 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 path that is not discussed too often in in the teachings. But anyway, it's good to come to it and also face it like we face anything else. Um, any other thoughts? I have one, mm -hmm. which is just. <clears throat> Uh, the fourth paragraph on the first page when something can go. And I think there's a conception that I fall into sometimes, which is like you can meditate away unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. But I think this was just going for me like it's the messiness of life is a big uh, contributing factor for your mental state, but how you up in the world and relationships and your work, etc. And you can meditate all day long, but then if you go and you have me, then you're going to have some fear and suffering come up. That's very, very, uh, very good observation. Um, uh, the, the, it relates with this saying that if you think that, if you think you are enlightened, go live with your family for one way. <laughs> it's them that says that this person is actually different from the person you knew before. Um, at the same time, we need to have this equanimity in mind to understand that the world known to us before any awakening is the same world that we go back to. It looks different, but you, the way you hold that world has changed. Your perception about it has changed. The things that bothered you before are not actually bothering you anymore. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. And the way you responded to certain things, like as we grow older, we the way we loved those toys, we don't play with them anymore. We we have we mature to let go of that, and same with our emotion, certain emotion. Um, for example, <clears throat> when we look at like if you want to be a preschool teacher, and when you were in preschool age, maybe you have fear of teaching that group, but when you become older and uh, mature, you can teach them because there's that mental separation from that age group to where you are now. So many things become easy that way. Um, but the aspect of being mean is, is something really uh, uh, privately and publicly amongst the instructor to always radiate loving kindness inwardly and outwardly, an easy way to live in this world. Otherwise, you can hate yourself, and that means you are a miserable person, right? It is often the case that um, those who say you are a nurse and that you yell at someone all the time, um, yell at you know you are you are the charge nurse and you yell at other people, and that means that person is suffering. Maybe a problem related to their home, something that they don't admit or they don't tell. But other people who don't know what is going on may take it personally that this person has a problem with. This world is imperfect that way. We actually. That's also a message for us to be kind 
because we don't know. I, I saw this image. This is a very beautiful image. Said that a huge circle drawn on an empty blank page, and there's a dot, and that dot is how much we know of a per about a person. There's a huge circle that we don't know, honestly. And that is why we always, if we forget to be kind, and we happen to be mean, which can happen, but we try to really work on that. Because by being mean, it hurts us more. And then it becomes a competition with you and your own you know, struggle. It's not a competition with anything or anyone or any person. It's just you being safe within your own mind and thinking. That is where the element of suffering slowly vanishes. Anything else? I have uh, collected some um, um, from my reading of fear. I have this uh, little, um, what are these called, um, points, bullet points that I, I thought will be useful for this discussion. I, but I have three pages of it, so I'm not sure if I can get to all of those. Um, uh, so, um, if people didn't feel fear, they wouldn't be able to protect themselves from legitimate threats. So that's one positive thing about fear that I included in meditation. Um, so we may feel this emotional danger. Um, and that is something that we humans have felt throughout the evolu evolution, uh, especially in ancient times when men and women regularly faced life or death situations that predators, you become food to some animal. Uh, but then over the years, humans started to gather in large cities and things like public public speaking became a thing that, that you have to address many individuals. Uh, and fear of elevators came. Um, and of course, fear of spiders. We really don't know where that. Some of these things are not known to us, like why we have that. Um, I have a strange theory of this that it connects with uh, one of the Buddha's teachings that the Buddha says we can be a human in this birth, and in another birth, you can be another kind of being. Therefore, you must honor all living beings, but those are the living beings, I think, can have fears of being eaten, and that fear can maybe get carried into a present birth of still while we are being born as humans. But you can say no to that. <laughs> it's just my thinking. Um, and the Buddha says he didn't say, he only taught so much that he didn't say certain things. Maybe these things that we are speculating are the things that he didn't teach. But uh, in terms of numbers, at least 60% of adults admit to having at least one unreasonable fear. So unreasonable. Um, although the research to date is not clear on why these fears manifest. Um, but some fears keep us safe, others cause distress. Um, one theory for fear is that humans have a genetic predisposition to fear. Um, that means things that were a threat to our ancestors, such as snakes, spiders, height, or water, um, so that has been stored in us, in our cells or in our subconsciousness. Um, and again, some another theory is that a first degree relative with a specific phobia appear more likely to have the 
uh, affect others of having that. Like it, it opened something in in close associates um, that they start thinking about it more than they should not. Um, and uh, the most common theory is that fear is related to a traumatic experience within your own past. So um, if I'm not sure if you have done any hypnosis session. I did one and I remember um, this specialist in Indonesia. She took me to an age uh, when I was um, just seven. At that age, I didn't have any of any fear, any anxiety, any problem. And she asked me to welcome that child to my present age and give a bear hug. And and that was really healing to me. Some of us don't we think that we should hug others, but when in fact we should really look into our own past and embrace that self before we were even corrupted <laughs> because of our own imaginations or because of learning things that we shouldn't have learned. There's no limit to things <laughs> that we can learn. Without us knowing, we just keep on learning things. Like now the social media term now, it, it unlocked a new fear in me. Like <laughs> when something strange had strange had, had happened, it unlocked a new fear in me. Um, um, it's, 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 so that means that fear is something that we learn. We we learn by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations, and thinking. We think and think and think, and now we have something that we didn't want, and we don't know how to unthink it. That's also a problem that we have. <laughs> and another uh, theory of fear is that personality traits, such as neuroticism, it appears to increase one's likelihood of developing a phobia. This is uh, perhaps true to my friend who is in Canada. He has the fear of taking airplanes. So he it's he sweats and he just doesn't know how he developed that. Uh, nobody knows, honestly. Some of the things are, because we are not supposed to know, some of the things can let go of it that they that we are not supposed to know it. It's just something sacred, not ours. <laughs> we can treat it that way. Um, and anything that we worry frequently, any negative thoughts, may also increase our risk of having prolonged fears. And another thing that they have observed is that being raised by overprotective parents or losing a parent, or sexual or physical abuse. So there are many pathways to fear from childhood to adolescence. And that uh, only problem is we don't want it. That not wanting is a desire. That we fight with it. But the reality is we have it. If you look at my palms, I often like to tell this to to give a message that this is reality, this is our expectation. The gap between the two is wider in some individuals. We come into reality means this gap closes and we are seeing things for what they actually are. Same with any emotion, whether it is joy, fear, or anything that we are experiencing but still treating it, uh, not identifying with it, because it's like your mother exists in your mind only when you think of it, think of her. Fear sometimes exists in our minds only when we think of it. Other times, we forget that we have maybe enjoyed riding a bicycle, enjoyed taking the train or taking a walk, gardening, but 
we tend to believe that no that thing called fear is taking so much space in our minds and ignore all other other activities that we have done that's our psychological nature the nature so refusing that reality that this fear can arise when conditions are present and it can disappear when it doesn't have to exist that's the truth the truth that it will arise and it will live and that it will disappear when it wants and do i need to control it say no don't come by doing that we are only feeding it perhaps not letting it be so when i teach children from my own exam- experiences that teachers in my um, you know grade 1 to grade 11 uh, they pushed me to the stage asking me to give a talk but they never taught me how, how to begin and how to what to say in the middle and how to end it so i had to first be panic about it at the same time also cover it and somehow come out of that experience but over the years of um developing that uh, i don't know i developed that it's just it stays with you so i i can i have a choice here i can hit those teachers forever and never do it or i can just take it as a blessing that they are they saw something in me that i couldn't see right and that i'm grateful that they chose me to do it and they didn't know any better so i i remember these good moments that i prepared so well i spoke to trees really i spoke to trees at home that our land was on a, on top of a mountain nobody could hear <laughs> nobody home and the next day i went to school and there was this uh, literary association and i gave that speech i remember all the praise i received that they saw something that they never saw in me but through those experiences we learn we continue learning we continue learning and developing some sense of gratitude so um so preparation knowing what instead of worrying it's so helpful i could have worried worried and worried and not have anything in my mind by the time i had to do it or i could have prepared and prepared and prepared and had something by the time i had to do the event which one would you choose preparing right yeah that that's helpful So this is uh, if i ran away saying no i don't want to do it i think i wouldn't be giving a talk to this level <laughs> to think it can it can control the future of a person completely um so that is the positive side that if i felt any i did feel ang- anxious but if i felt Uh, any anxiety uh, what i learned was that this is because i want to do better and it helped me so i start teaching that to the teenagers who are struggling with similar issues before you know so because some of us don't have that knowledge we don't have the time to even learn all that in our life because we are running after a school curriculum and having to finish many exams and get through those barriers then only you know after, later that we start studying them so the message um that i uh, i think is helpful uh, from my readings here is also that many fears are learned um by most commonly by overthinking and building responses in our own subconscious 
think about that that we we build that response in us thinking that what if this happens to me that's where everything started <laughs> although it is not true it has never happened to us it's just a false information so it's not true so you can always ask we can always ask is it true has it ever happened is it necessary and if it is still bothering us maybe we can use i'm not a psychiatrist to prescribe any medication but they have beta blockers right that they uh, the, the psychiatrist can prescribe these beta blockers to keep the level of panic lower so you can focus but never to ne- you know never to depend on them but using also your own ability to sit and meditate and undo and unlearn some of this okay um any questions yeah i'm curious about the on the first page the paragraph about meeting fear you know like if fear came while i was walking back and forth i would not stand or sit down yeah and when i read that it sounds enigmatic and i mean clear you know like i'll stay right where i am but also you know um so i just wonder is there some like when you read that part of the text what does that mean to you what is the buddha doing to 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 the fear in that moment i had that same question this this felt uh, to me that it's little stubborn that mm-hmm. you can get in trouble by not by being there because there's a reason for fear to arise in us <laughs> um yes i did feel you feel the same way uh, but what he's doing here is seeing fear as a thing that is in here not outside um same with uh, anger it is a thing we have in here not caused by others that whatever the outside thing triggers it in us so he wanted to pause and investigate his own response that is how i see it now that that he so it just he he could have run away from it like many monks may have done in the in the forest because they fear of tiger and fear of, you know it's just our mind creates a whole scenario that is not even true and that is what he didn't want to run away from does that make any sense mm-hmm. anything else any questions from zoom yeah so when when the fear comes on and it's like overwhelming and not so conscious that you're talking about does meditation gradually if you practice and you can be found that it's a conscious thing and sit that fear what are what are ways that we can concretely practice this the you know i expected that to happen but like any expectation i was disappointed that it didn't <laughs> happen that way <laughs> truly yeah i remember having conversations with monks and nuns what is this anxiety that i am feeling <laughs> this was um, before even beginning school here that i started feeling that anxiety and i realized maybe i want to face it there's a part of me wanting to face it and another part of me saying you don't need it kind of so that duality but to answer your question what actually helped me was wisdom uh, developing more and more wisdom that is very close to what the actual reality of fear is that it is not yours it's not caused by you it arises and vanishes and you can observe that arising instead of feeding it so you have a disconnect with it and that helped me so much even if i had moments where i acted in fear and i said something because of fear 
um, now I can go back to those moments without giving any pressure to me about that because it's a past event and it had it cannot be edited by correcting your present way of responding you can feel whole again you can feel good again that you are retraining your mind to think better so using that moral uh, judgment admitting that you said the wrong thing because of fear it's it's not good for my values and that reasoning helps you to not own the past but because past exists only when you think of it future exists only when you think of it the present exists at this moment which is you know completely here completely yours and bringing up that wholesome energy helps wisdom cultivation a huge part in buddha teaching it starts with behavioral changes that includes how you speak and how you act in the world privately and publicly with integrity and so on and stillness collectedness of your mind through meditation so first one is moral conduct second one is collectedness of mind third is wisdom wisdom governs everything wisdom leads you to the final awakening anything else no okay let's share some list may the suffering ones be suffering free fear struck fearlessly may the grieving shed all grief may all beings find relief may all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect us and protect the teaching. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, have a wonderful rest of the day, rest of the evening. See you when we see you again. Bye-bye.